Boom! What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Super pumped to be talking about multi-agent environments and artificial intelligence. We have Todor Markov joining us on the show. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm really excited for this episode. There's so much to learn about this field that's permeating into every aspect of our lives. For those that don't know Todor's background, he is a machine learning researcher at OpenAI with degrees from Stanford in Symbolic Systems and Statistics. His current focus is on multi-agent environments and transfer learning. And you can find the links in the bio below to OpenAI.com as well as Twitter's OpenAI, as well as Todor Markov's GitHub, his website there, and his LinkedIn profile link. So you can find all of those below, check them out. Todor, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Right. So I think today um, a lot of changes in the world are strongly driven by uh, emerging new technologies like artificial intelligence, but also like uh, genomics, uh, software, material science. I think today is particularly exciting because we are seeing significant speed up and uh, impressive new developments in some of these fields like AI, but also in things like 3D printing. And I think a lot of the uh, future of humanity is going to be driven by developments in these technologies and by uh, how well we can use them to improve the human condition. And how do you think we can ensure that the technologies are used to hmm. enhance yeah. the human condition? Uh, I think that's a hard question. <laughs> it's a question that a lot of scientists think deeply about, a lot of policy people think deeply about. I think that um, it would require uh, just being uh, careful with technologies that we're developing while at the same time realizing that uh, we cannot, uh, it's not really an option to stand still and try to bring progress to a halt. So I think doing this sort of careful balancing between continuing to move forward, continuing to develop new technologies while uh, being careful about uh, safety considerations, about being inclusive, and really thinking deeply about the effects that the technology is going to have on different people is the way to go forward. Yeah, the very careful. Slow, but thinking geopolitically, how to do it, not, yeah, yeah, but not standing still. Yes. Is, yes, yes, okay. Okay, okay, let's get to, let's get to the journey. So, born in Bulgaria, yes. and actually we were wondering, we were like, is Markov, uh, is he Markov chain? Yeah, yeah, you're like, no, 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 common surname uh, yes. for Bulgarians. And so you left at 18 to go to Stanford, and that's where you did some boxes and statistics. Um, I'm curious, who were you when you were young that kind of like linked you into uh, being passionate about science and technology? Ah, yes. So when I was in Bulgaria, uh, growing up, I had the very good fortune of going to uh, what's called a gymnasium, which is a specialized school for that focuses on mathematics and natural science. So I went to a really great school in Bulgaria. I had the great fortune of having really great teachers. Uh, I did a lot of contests in Bulgaria, both uh, in math, both nationally and internationally. I got some great mentorship from uh, the team leads for the national math team in Bulgaria. I got some great peers, great friends from that experience. And uh, that's how I got really passionate about math and science and new technologies. And that's also how I decided that I wanted to study abroad for college because a lot of other people who were competing uh, had done it and they had great experience doing it. So I decided that, hey, I want to do that too. It seems cool. And here I am. 
Whoa, what a gymnasium is what it's called? Yes. Yeah, so this was a, was it like a whole height? It was a middle school and high school? Yes. Part, like, okay. Yes, fifth wow. to twelfth grade. Fifth to twelfth grade, nice. And powerful teachers, curriculum. Yes. Yeah, the mentorship is, is crucial. And also you saw some, you saw people before you going abroad. And yes. so you were able to also make the decisions go abroad. Now, when you got to Stanford and you started mm-hmm. surrounding yourself with other really smarty pants kids from <laughs> around the world, what was that like? Uh, it was interesting. I think from a diversity perspective, it was much higher diversity than my peer group in high school. My peer group in high school had uh, a lot of people who were extremely technically proficient in math, in physics, in computer science, but it had uh, a f- much smaller number of people who would be really good at, say, history or philosophy, who would have really in-depth read about it and thought about it just because the educational system didn't reward it as much. Whereas at Stanford, there was a much higher variety in terms of um, people who are doing more humanities or artsy type of things. There were more people also who had worked on interesting site projects, like things in robotics or uh, small startup ideas, that type of thing. At the same time, I actually found that uh, the average, or maybe even the top 70, the top uh, 20th percentile people were, from a purely technical perspective, in math or in physics, were uh, not quite as good as the national team at Bulgaria. So in that sense, it helped a lot in terms of, I think a lot of people coming into Stanford have a very strong intimidation uh, factor of, oh my God, everyone here is so good. And for me, it was more like, yeah, people here are like very good. They're very talented. They're all smart kids. But I've been in a similar situation before with people who are like just as good, if not better. Nice. That's a cool reply. Okay. And then um, how about then, would you say that symbolic systems and statistics are two of the better fields to go into if you want to go into machine learning? Uh, Yes, I think they're both great options for symbolic systems. So let me first talk a little bit about what that is. Uh, Symbolic systems is a program at Stanford that encompasses several different disciplines. So we studied linguistics, we studied philosophy, we studied a little bit of neuroscience, and then we studied uh, math and computer science. So it's similar to cognitive science degrees at other universities, but it tends to be more technical and focuses uh, a little bit more on the math side and on the computer science side. But at the same time, it's still very flexible and it allows you to specialize in whatever you're interested in. So symbolic systems, it has specializations ranging from applied logic to neuroscience to artificial intelligence. So it gives you a really high degree of flexibility in terms of making it what you want it to be. And that is one of the main reasons that I was very attracted to it. Flexibility, God. Flexibility, baby. Yes. I agree. And then statistics as well. Yes, I think statistics is uh, a lot of the theoretical uh, models behind um, machine learning and deep learning to the extent that they exist are driven by statistical models uh, and statistical thinking. So I think statistics is a very good way of approaching or getting into machine learning or deep learning, especially for people who are a little bit more mathematical, uh, a little bit more theoretical, who want to build a little bit more intuitions about, okay, I want to actually know what this thing is doing and why it's working, and are a little bit less satisfied by just, okay, it's not working, let me add three more layers in my neural net and try again. So to actually understand why it's working, why it isn't working, know where to uh, troubleshoot, uh, to b- debug, this type of stuff. Yes. And right now, there's a relatively little, like, very rigorous theoretical understanding of why and how deep learning works. There is a little bit, and it's a very active area of research. There's lots of 
uh, people in math and statistics who are starting to pay more attention to it. But I think it's a really exciting field. And I think, yes, for more theoretical people who are interested in this field, statistics is a great way to get into uh, AI, get into deep learning, and attack the problems in the field from a bit more uh, theoretical approach. And then, so then you also spent a good amount of time um, doing EA stuff, logic, robotics, you like climbing, philosophy, <laughs> so these are kind of like some of the fields that you're interested in. But you ended up m doing some work in tech and finance, Bridgewater, yes. the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, yes. Blend, but oh, this is all pre-open AI. Yes. And what was kind of some of the big core takeaways from that period for you? Uh, lots of different things, and different things for, um, uh, all the different places, but I think core takeaways were uh, communication is really important. You should uh, try and have very clear lines of communication with everyone you're working with and also with four relationships in your life beyond work. Uh, you should uh, strive very hard to be comfortable uh, giving people feedback even if it's critical, and also receiving critical feedback from people and acting on that. Uh, and on a more uh, practical project-based level, I think uh, those experiences were very useful for me in terms of uh, picking up skills like uh, how to learn things on your own effectively, how to take a big, vague project, break it up into bite-sized chunks, and then execute on those chunks one by one, um, how to manage your time well, things like that. Yeah, okay, whoa. So this is like actually quite important to go and pick up these skill sets that you're yes. talking about prior to either doing entrepreneurship or joining other industries. It's like learning about those skills and applying them in the rest of your life practices. Good, very good, okay. Now, okay. Open AI stuff. Hmm. Give us a quick, um, the quick like mission on Open AI. So Open AI's mission is to develop artificial general intelligence. So artificial intelligence that is human level or above in uh, any task of uh, economic or intellectual interest to humans, and we want to do this in a way that's safe and in a way that is fair, such that the benefits from uh, this artificial general intelligence are fairly distributed across all of humanity and are not overly concentrated in a, a certain set of countries or a certain set of shareholders to the exclusion of other people. Wow, yeah. That's huge. This, see, this is why the, when we were saying earlier, OpenAI has one of those those ethic core ethics mm. that is safety and fairness. Yes. And this is a big part of some of the code updates that we're having is this inclusive mm. stakeholders. Yes. That this is not just for extremely wealthies and rock it off. This is for all of us to go from triangle to circle on the planet, the decentralized yes. infrastructures that are coming in. I love that part. Um, okay, now let's get into, um, let's, let's start breaking down some of this work. You guys have been you guys have been actually like blowing everyone's minds um, with with creating um, re which right now are narrow um, mm. artificial yes. intelligences that are beating uh, humans at what we used to think couldn't happen. Um, <laughs> Dota Two, yes. Starcraft. Um, these games are and here and here we have some example videos where we're actually going to be talking about how these things work. And yes. one of the core parts is the competitive self play component. Yes, so competitive self-play is a key idea right now in how uh, AI systems, especially in competitive games like uh, Go or Dota or StarCraft are developed. Uh, it was originally the first big example of competitive self-play was AlphaGo back in 2016 when it defeated the, uh, the world champion Lisa Do and everyone was super shocked because many people did not expect that to happen for at least 10 years. And the key idea, so AlphaGo wasn't trained entirely with competitive self-play, but a lot of its training was self-play. And the key idea 
is very simple. Uh, the idea is that if you have some sort of competitive two-player or even with more than two-player uh, game, you're just going to have the same agent continuously play against itself and slowly get better that way. And the reason that works is that it provides what we call an automatic curriculum. It's always at the uh, appropriate level where it's difficult enough that you can learn new things, but um, not so hard that uh, you just have no idea what's going on and you can't learn any, anything. So if I had to draw a comparison, if you were uh, learning to play chess and you were a mid-ranked level, if you're playing against, say, your six-year-old nephew, you probably wouldn't learn that much. And if you're playing against Bobby Fischer, you probably also wouldn't learn that much. But if you're playing around someone at your level, then that's when a lot of learning is actually going to happen. And competitive self-play is one way to induce that sort of appropriate difficulty level where it's hard enough that you can learn, but not so hard that uh, you're just stuck and don't know what to do. Yeah, that part's critical. This is like when adults play with children mm -hmm. and it's not the adults bring down their skill level yes. to the ch children's skill level so yes. that the children can learn, just keep winning at about the same skill level that they know and a little more. But the crazy thing is that you can then do that over and over again. So as it incrementally learns, it's continuously going up one level, incrementally learning times millions of plays. Yes. And this is what's crazy. When we take millions of plays at Go or StarCraft, it takes us a lifetime. Yes. But millions of plays for you is a day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's definitely... Uh, for this type of games, especially when you can perfectly simulate them and, and where you have access to uh, uh, perfectly accurate simulation data, this is extremely strong because you can just have it play a lot. And it's still, it's horribly inefficient compared to a human. Uh, like a pro, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like this, th this probably took uh, like hundreds of thousands of tries. And <laughs> If you had to do it, you would do it way faster. faster yeah. And with Dota, like OG, who are a top-ranked, world-class team, they played for maybe uh, 10, 20, or they learned to play for 10, 15 years, something like that. Yeah. OpenAI's bot spent 45,000 years, which is insane. I don't know if like, the total human amount of time spent playing Dota is equal to 45,000 years. And 45,000 years was played in how much time? Uh, that was over uh, seven or eight months. Seven something or like eight that. months. 45,000 years worth of gameplay. Yes. In seven to eight months. This is why the creative potential to learn things that even humans haven't tested in yes. given the scenarios and circumstances is just so much higher. Yes, and we did see that during the matches between OpenAI and OG where OpenAI did some uh, very unusual strategies which no one in Dota really does. So we did uh, like a very aggressive game but also a very aggressive use of buybacks during the mid game which I don't know of any other team that has used this in the past. And uh, from looking at interviews with OG after the match, and also actually just talking with the contractor teams that we've had that were testing the team for us, we found that or playing against the bot really helped them tighten up their game and explore new things, get new ideas for how they can improve their own game. Yeah. So I think that really also highlights the potential for AI to uh, act together with humans and help them learn and help them improve and get better at the yeah. things that they care about. Yep, yep. The, um, the hybrid potential is yes. very, very beautiful. I want to ask a, a couple questions on the technical side. I think it's important to at least break this down. Um, what, what are the environments where you're, where you're designing? Um, this, is, uh, this is CAD, computer-aided design. Uh, this one, I'm guessing, is a reskinned version of Mujoko, which Mujoko. is, uh, yeah, Mujoko stands okay. for uh, multi-joint control. Multi and it is control. a 
fairly, it's a very good physics simulator that's very popular for um, AI research, especially for research in robotics, because uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a reasonably accurate simulator of, uh, that models lots of different real world physics. It's not perfect, clearly, but it does a very good job. It, does, yeah. it has uh, good support and uh, lots of researchers really like it. I like it. I think it's good. And this is a physics simulator, Mujoko. Yes. yes. Interesting. And then um, in terms of how the actual uh, math works behind the physics simulation mm. component, how the designs are actually made and how they're really quickly computing on exactly how to, in this case, it's seeing if you can get the ball kicked past the goalkeeping opponent. Yep. Or in the other one, we had the sumo example where they yes. were trying to push each other out of the ring. Yes. So how is the math working in the background where it's trying to realize where the other object is, how to push it? Mm. How is that happening? Right. So actually most of the math here is uh, baked into the simulator. So the, the physics part has a lot of math in it. And that one is, uh, I actually, don't know that many details about it. I've played a little bit with the internals of Mujoko, but mm -hmm. as we said, it's lots of complicated math. Uh, yeah. And um, on the agent side, in terms of how is the uh, how is the agent actually learning to do things? Yeah. How is it uh, learning how to do sumo well, or how is it learning to stay upright when it's being pushed by wind? Uh, yeah. there, there is some math, but actually most of the math is we, we don't explicitly tell the agent, hey, here's how you play, you do sumo well, or hey, here's how you stand upright uh, when there's wind. What we do is uh, we just, we use something called reinforcement learning. So uh, the idea is that when the agent is interacting with the environment, it gets uh, a certain reward if certain things happen. So for example, in the goalkeeping task, you get a reward if you score a goal and the keeper gets a reward if it stops the ball, if it stops a goal from being scored. In the sumo task, you get a reward if you trip the other, uh, your opponent. In the wind task, you get a reward if you don't fall down. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you have these rewards and then you have an update rule, which um, it varies depending on the specific algorithm it's doing, but the general idea is that uh, you tell your agent, hey, here's how you learn based on uh, how, how you do a small learning step based on what you did in this episode and the reward that you got. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so the basics are somewhat simple. There's still some math involved, but uh, I think it's the math there is m relatively simple compared to the math in the physics simulator. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> it's still, it's the impressive part is that it's still able to learn these relatively complicated tasks uh, where uh, like in this case it's the sumo game and the wind and the um, by kicking the ball, but it can also learn extremely complicated things. It can learn how to play Go, mm -hmm. it can learn how to play Dota, and at an extremely high level. And those things are something where if you try to explicitly tell the uh, agent, hey, here are the rules by which you play Go at a world-class level, here are the rules by which you play Dota at a world-class level, you, you would never be able to do that. Just yeah. Humans don't know how to do that on an explicit level. If you ask Lee Sedo, hey, why is that move good? Uh, he can point at some um, general insights, but um, it, it's not something where you can write a checklist and then by following the checklist, you can uh, play go well. It relies a lot on intuition and implicit representations. and. I think it's very impressive that this type of simple learning rules can yeah. learn these very complicated intuitions, these very complicated internal representations. That you can create an aware character agent in the physics simulator and then 
uh, as they do something like prevent this person from running past that line that they get rewarded and they know yes. that then that is a behavior that I should continue. Yes. Very similar to us as agents in this world as well when we do something like exercise or choose a healthy food option or when we uh, achieve a bunch of goals that we have set for ourselves we get rewarded and yes. so these is yeah 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 so yeah anyway we'll get to that question at the very <laughs> end of the show <laughs> okay let's um did we we did the wind attack one two ron did we do the second one too this is the wind or this is the, this is the wind attack right yes yeah okay so then so this is this is putting a a uh, an, you're putting a vector of 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 wind at like a certain degree of strength. Yes. And asking the agent to stay on the sumo the platform. Yes. So the interesting part about this one is that actually this agent that's here right now is the same agent that was playing sumo before. So. Uh, the agent that was, play, that was playing sumo, we took it out and we placed it in this new environment with wind. And it's never seen wind before. And we actually didn't allow it to train. We told it, here's this new environment, here's this new thing that you have no idea what it is. You've never seen it before. Figure it out. And the thing that we like is that actually it's reasonably good at figuring it out. It's doing reasonable things. It has this squatting stance. It's kind of stable. It's trying to stay in the center. And this is without any training uh, on a new environment that it hasn't seen before. So this is an example of what we call transfer or transfer learning, mm -hmm. where things that you have learned in uh, one environment that you've trained in then transfer in a different environment with somewhat different dynamics. So awesome. as we see here, it turns out that the things that you learn for staying upright in sumo, for not getting tripped over, they also help you if you don't have another opponent, but if you have winds Wind. that you need to deal with. That's so cool. This is like the kind of the first incremental steps towards trying to generalize a yes, narrow exactly. intelligence. Yeah, that's beautiful. Beautiful example. Okay, and then the next one is this. Um, the you guys had an what was it an an ant, uh, a bug, and a spider with yes. two legs, four legs, and six legs. Or two legs, sorry, four legs, six legs, and eight legs. Yes. Yes. So this work uh, was something done by my team, uh, multi the multi agent team mm -hmm. at OpenAI. I think about a year or two years ago, around that time frame. And the idea here is that you have um, two different algorithms. Uh, one is just a regular deep reinforcement uh, learning algorithm, and the other is a meta-learning algorithm, which uh, can learn and adapt based on, uh, within an episode, what the other agent is doing. So. Uh, Initially, this was uh, for this work. We had a population of uh, these different algorithms who are also controlling these uh, different robots. So the four-legged leg, leg robot we call it an ant. The six-legged mm -hmm. green robot we call it a bug. And there was also a eight-legged robot that was called a spider. Mm -hmm. So the bug is the strongest one in terms of physical strength. Okay. Uh, so things like how much uh, force can okay. you apply on your, on your joints? and the spider was the weakest one. Uh, and so we ran these multiple algorithms with running on multiple robots, on robots in a uh, uh, tournament league yeah. where yeah, yeah. we uh, uh, ran evolution on that league. So agents and algorithms that win uh, got to survive and replicate and agents and algorithms that lost uh, would continue, uh, would be pruned and eliminated. That's the fifth asset, Ron, if you want to bring that one up. Um, so that shows, like you were just describing, that over time you can actually see which agents are the winners in all of these different simulations that occur. Yeah. And over time, one of the models beats out the other ones, and that's the, yeah. it's called the meta, meta, a model agnostic meta learning yes. algorithm. Yep, exactly. So we see here that spiders don't do as well because they're weak, but also uh, 
meta learning the meta learning algorithm does better than the regular algorithm and also there is a difference here in terms of uh, model architecture versus uh, like whether the architecture of the neural net you're using is has aware of is aware of time of what's happened uh, during the wrestling before or whether it just uh, treats every time step individually. So being aware of time also helps a lot. And agents who are aware of time end up doing much better in this tournament. Uh, but yes, yeah, something that was interesting here that we thought was important is that uh, even with the ant, a weaker agent, uh, the meta-learning algorithm was still stronger and better by a bug controlled by a regular reinforcement learning algorithm. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yes, the broad idea behind meta-learning algorithms yes. is that they're learning how to learn. Uh, they can learn how to do different tasks qu quickly. Uh, they can adapt to new circumstances quickly. And uh, this was one a uh, small but I think still important example of why this matters and how this helps you uh, perform better in uh, competition with other agents, but also potentially on other tasks that you might care about. Versus a reinforcement learning. Versus, well, meta-learning is still technically, technically a reinforcement, reinforcement learning okay. algorithm, but it's a specific approach to it, which okay. uh, has advantages over regular algorithms. It also has some disadvantages. Visible. They can sometimes be slightly less okay. stable. It can be hard to get them to work. But uh, I think it's an exciting area of research within reinforcement cool. learning. So the edge of knowledge has been pushed in reinforcement learning, and now we're going even further and seeing which algorithms of reinforcement learning are good at whichever tasks within that within that field. Uh, yes, or we're thinking about how, usually most algorithms at, of reinforcement learning, they're good for many different tasks. So the same algorithm that uh, plays Dota, it can also learn to uh, use a robotic hand to manipulate a cube. Mm -hmm. And it has no idea what environment it's working that's on. That's the same reinforcement learning algorithm? Yes. The same one that's, so that, so that, that, that does then generalize. Uh, sort of. So sort it's of. not the same weights. It's not it, okay. the same, uh, like the model itself is, the learned model is different. But if you start from a novel model, the same algorithm that learns how to play Dota, it can also learn how to control the robotic hand. And it assigns weights to variables over time. Yes. Based That's on correct. the rewards. Yes. Okay. Yeah, there was there was um, there was an interesting component um, to this, which was that at some point um, you actually this is it's it's right here that um, rewards for behaviors that aid exploration, like standing and moving forward, mm. which are eventually annealed to zero in favor of being rewarded for just winning and yes. losing. I thought that part was really interesting. So yes. at first, it's like. You get rewarded for doing these interesting, uh, even just standing up, being exploring. Yes. And then that goes to zero because the most important reward is whether or not you can win the game of sumo yes. pushing the other thing off. Yes. So, yeah, this is an example of uh, something that is a, um, a hard problem in reinforcement learning that is also an active area of research, which is... Uh, how to solve exploration problem and also sparse versus dense rewards, which is one approach to it. So in general, um, in reinforcement learning, we say that you have a sparse reward if uh, the reward that you're getting is relatively rare. So say you only win it, you only get reward once you defeat the other agent in sumo. Mm -hmm. And we say that you're getting dense reward if you're getting uh, a reward much more frequently, yes. like for example, reward based on, are you still upright? If you're right. still upright, you're getting reward. reward. And there's a trade-off between those two things. Sparse rewards help you uh, be much more accurate in terms of targeting exactly the behavior that uh, you want to learn. Like mm -hmm. if you're playing chess, you care about uh, checkmating the other uh, the opponent 
you don't necessarily care uh, what type of opening you're playing or mid-game as long as you can checkmate your mm -hmm. opponent. Mm -hmm. But when the reward is sparse, that makes it harder for the agent to learn yeah. because in the beginning it's kind of doing random things and if it's hard to get the reward, it may never figure out what is expected of it. So if I were to draw a parallel here, uh, like if you wanted to, like if you had a dog and you wanted to train it to uh, do tricks, you would not start with very complicated things because <laughs> it would, uh, it would never be getting rewards and go, it would go, never figure out what it like, needs to do. Like, you start with like fetch me orange juice. The <laughs> dog would never <laughs> yes, be able to. <laughs> exactly. So you want to start... Roll uh, over, something like that. Yeah, you yeah. start with simple things and you gradually increase the complexity. Mm -hmm. And this is also what we did in the sumo game where we started with simple things like, okay, stay upright, move towards the center of the uh, Interesting. room. But eventually we wanted to actually do the thing which we care about, which is win at sumo. So yes. as time progresses, yes. we start rewarding it less for the simple things and more for the actual victory. And at the wow. end, we're only rewarding it for the actual victory. Wow, okay, so you start with the dense rewards and then over time, the rewards become sparse rewards. Yes. Wow, that's, that's a really cool component to reinforcement learning. Wow, competitive self-play is freaking crazy. <laughs> this, look at this, it's like running, you know, look at this. It's just, it's, it's nuts how quickly these agents can learn to be mm. so much at their peak, at their absolute best. And the applicabilities of this are mm. also into like all of the like automobile and like manufacturing and um, airline and um, even so many other simulations and biotech and other mm. fields, just like how do you optimize Yes. for a given uh, variable like constraints. Um, how do you optimize? Like you can literally test like a part on a vehicle mm. for uh, 100,000 miles and see how well it does, stuff like that. Yes, though actually that's another open research problem in reinforcement learning that's very important and that people are very interested in solving in that uh, right now RO actually hasn't been applied directly in the real world that much. And the reason is that it is extremely data hungry, so it requires these simulations. But a lot of simulations, they, are, uh, they don't perfectly match the real world. And if you directly train in simulation and then try to transfer in the real world, oftentimes your thing is just not going to work because the real world is different. There is a bunch of things happening there that are not in your simulation. And like this is- Like potholes in the road or something. Like yes. That. Yeah. Yeah. So this is called the uh, sim to real transfer problem. And it's a very active area of research in robotics. People are super excited about it. Lots of smart people are thinking very deeply about it and again, trying to the, solve it. The, the name of it is, again? Uh, sim to real problem. The Simulation to sim reality. Sim to real problem. Yes. Whoa. That's a good one too, the sim to real problem, simulation to reality problem. Yes. Okay, um, let's go into our, um, the neural MMO. Wow, yes. okay, so MMO, ma uh, massive um, multiplayer online and RPG role playing games, usually how we see these things, yes. um, like the World of Warcraft of, um, and the Grand Theft Auto multiplayer, sam big sandbox games, these yes. types of things. And um, this is crazy because you have, uh, you're simulating uh, agents that are playing here, and this is 128 concurrent yes. agents playing um, over 100 concurrent servers running 128 each-ish, or yes. anywhere variant, and then 100 million lifetimes. When I was reading this, I was like, <laughs> this is nuts. Okay, so yeah, so Neural MMO, teach us about this. <laughs> yes, so Neural MMO is a project that an intern on the multi-agent team, Joseph Suarez, he worked over on this over the summer uh, of 2018. And so this ties in the uh, broader uh, mission of the multi-agent team, where the multi-agent team is interested, or we believe that uh, complex environments with large-scale multi-agent interaction lead to uh, the emergence of complex skills, complex behavior, and that also this behavior cool. is robust and generalizable. So it's useful in many uh, 
interesting, cool tasks outside of the original environment that you're training with. So Neuro MMO was uh, kind of like a proof of concept for this exact idea where uh, we wanted to test out a relatively simple environment with simple dynamics and see, uh, oh, if we have a massive number of agents interacting here, are we going to see cool stuff happening? Yeah. And we do see some pretty interesting things. Like a lot of camping around the edge. <laughs> <laughs> so much camping along yeah. the edge. But yeah. also exploration into the middles and yes. stuff. Yeah, yeah. So some really cool things that I think for me were possibly the main takeaways from this work is that one, uh, agents which are trained with a larger, numbers, uh, a larger number of other agents uh, oh, so to explain a bit how the game works, mm -hmm. it's relatively simple. You have all of these agents, they're uh, walking around this map, they're trying to forage for food, and they can also fight with each other. And um, so we see even from this simple of an environment with a oh, large amount of... Ron, go ahead and pull up the seventh one, asset as well. That'll also help you with this yep. part of the description. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so you have the agents, you can see them fighting here and also... Uh, I think there's food items around, lying around that they're trying to forage. Mm -hmm. And um, you see, um, we see some really interesting uh, behavior, some really interesting things happening, even from a relatively simple environment like this. So one important thing that we see is if you're an agent that were trained in a, competing with a large population, you end up being roughly stronger. Uh, somewhat stronger. So if you are trained uh, during your life with a hundred other agents and then you're put in a server with uh, agents that in their life were trained with 10 other agents uh, on their map, then you end up being stronger and you're able to outcompete them. If you are trained with more other agents, you end up uh, exploring more, you walk around the map more, you're slightly better at foraging. Mm -hmm. uh, and a third thing that is somewhat related is also that um, when you train uh, different subpopulations of agents, you see these uh, geographical niches form where each subpopulation likes certain parts of the map and kind of stays there and tries not to walk into other, other subpopulations uh, niches so that it doesn't have to fight with them. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas mm -hmm. if you only have uh, one subpopulation, it tends to uh, roam more widely and there are no individual niches that form. Whoa, so, <clears throat> so each one of the, the, the characters uh, have, uh, the, they have, they're trying to weigh out uh, how close they want to be to other characters because then they can throw those items to take each other's health bars down. Um, yes. Also, they have to forage for nutrients on yes. the map. And so they're trying to balance all these things out. A lot are, you know, hang out by the, like in the center, you have a, there's a larger uh, surface area around the, um, around the uh, diameter of, of the, to be attacked. Um, yes. So like, that's why some hang out around the edge because there's only 180 degree versus 360, et cetera. Yep. These are, this, so, so these are some of like these, when you, when you compete on this map with the, like say what the 128 of these, and then you become the best here, then you get mm. moved up to where all of the other bests across <laughs> all of the other servers were competing against mm. each other? Uh, I'm not sure if we did it, we might have done this, but something that we did do was we took some agents that competed with 128, we took some agents that competed with 64, we took some agents that competed with 32, uh, we took some agents that competed with 16, and then like we put them all together and we said, fight, we want to see who's the best. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that we do see somewhat qualitatively different uh, behavior where uh, in general, agents that were trained with more other agents end up uh, performing better. And also maybe a component of this, we're not sure if this is a causal factor, but one other thing that they do is they just explore more, they uh, roam around the map a little bit more, whereas 
agents that were trained with a smaller number of other agents, they tend to hang out more closer to the initial spots that they started, that they uh, were spawned in, and they don't move as much. And that may have to do with how on the 128 scale that there's just so many more pieces of, inf of, no of knowledge to gain about how to play at the best level versus if you're only playing against 12 or 24. Uh, Potentially. Yeah, I think it has to do with the fact that there's just more competition in the 128. So you yeah. need to roam further in order to uh, like not be fighting all the time and in order to uh, oh. yeah, avoid this type of expensive fighting. Oh, Whereas yeah. with okay. 16, you can move five steps and you're fine. Oh, well, 128. Okay. oh, it's the same size terrain. Yes, it's the same size oh, terrain. Oh, because if the terrain doesn't scale, that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because you can more freely walk around. You end up com combating less. And um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You. Okay. Um, and then yeah, that last, um, the last one, Ronnie. Um, so this one shows then how they move on the terrains. This image. Yes. And so if this the center one is when there's only one agent. Yeah. So this is an yeah. image that illustrates the we'll uh, zoom, zoom out a thing bit. Yeah. about niche speciation that I was talking about. So when you only have uh, one species, like in the center image, uh, you end up with just one uh, relatively uh, like big piece of the map that the agents like to hang out in and uh, there is no, um, they're kind of uni uh, uniformly distributed across this, uh, like, uh, this red stripe here. Whereas when you have more species, so when you have eight species like in the left image, the different colors are the different subpopulations and you see how the different subpopulations end up liking uh, different uh, pieces of the map and they tend to uh, hang out in the, in the same area as other, um, as other agents within their subpopulation and they don't intersect that much with agents from other subpopulations. And we, we think that this is mostly driven by um, just avoiding needless fighting, mm -hmm. but we think that it's also uh, an interesting toy proof of concept for specialization and niche formation uh, emerging as a part of this multi-agent interaction. And we hope that in the future with more complicated environments, we are going to see more interesting specialization, more interesting niche formation. Mm. So we are, uh, we are relatively uh, happy and this result makes us somewhat optimistic that we are going to see that in a more complicated environment. And this is going to lead us to the question that uh, we must ask now. Are we already in one of these massive multiplayer <laughs> online role-playing game environments? Hmm. Uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> If we are, there haven't been any very direct signs of it. I think the, the counter question I like to ask to that is if you knew that you were in a simulation for sure, or if you knew that for sure you were not in a simulation, would that change your life in any way? Would it change the actions that you take on a day-to-day -day basis? Good counter question, Ron. Thoughts? Yeah. Oh, change Ron's. Sure. How, how, how did it change it, Ron? I don't fuck around now. That's all, period. No fear. Hmm. I call it like I see it. I stand corrected when I'm corrected. I live my life. I try to stand up for the oppressed. There's something among us that wants to control us and they can go fuck themselves. Hmm. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, Ron. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's it. So, so the behavior has, has, did change. It did change. Hmm. Once you, once you learned? Well, at first it was, don't get me wrong, it was frightening when, you, when you're aware that there's something much larger than all of us trying to work uh, through us, to manipulate us, to control us, to do its will, 
nothing less than uh, slavery all across the boards. And now that uh, the, the most uh, intelligent of us have realized that, uh, geez, something's trying to enslave us. And, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's, 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 let's try to beat it and let's try to uh, speak out against it. And then when we do that, then we become enslaved as well. You know, so it's looking for just ignorant uh, people that speak uh, confidently of shit they know nothing about. So this is the something beyond the three-dimensional realities taking its oh it's m yeah multi-dimensional way something, beyond 3D reality. So something multi-dimensional comes in through Earth. Uh, yeah, and through us. Through if us. If we allow it. Through us. If we allow it. And then and then we, if and then so this is the realization then that Ron is talking about and Todor's question may seems like it was maybe somewhat I think related but also <laughs> like. Um, in terms of this already being a simulation, in terms of this already being a massive multiplayer online role playing we're, game. We're cracking the code. We're hacking, we're hacking it. And we're doing it to the best for humanity. All of us, collectively. Ron and I, about a, a, maybe a month ago or so, we're just talking about as we continue hmm. to make these MMORPG simulations ourselves, we gain a better understanding of mm. how we could potentially already be in one that is being mm -hmm. manipulated by the creators mm. of it. So that's why once you make really complex simulations using super intelligence, it's easier for us to look in the mirror and realize, well, that how is, what? Is that already <laughs> happening to us? Yeah, so these types of things. It's very hard to, mm. yeah, it's very abstract. We're still far away from it, all that stuff. But. Yeah, they don't like me talking like I just <laughs> talked either. They get really upset. If I end up dead in the street later on today, you know why. There is also an interesting question around agency in that uh, I think if you're thinking about a simulation, it's um, usually I think it implies that whoever is running it is, I think it in a sense anthropomorphizes them or it assumes that they have a conscious experience or a certain set of goals. And it's not, um, it seems, possible that you might have uh, like w there are ways that the world might be where like what we experience is kind of like a simulation but there is no one necessarily running it or the thing running it is closer to a natural process or a force of nature rather than uh, an agent that has conscious experience and I think that kind of blurs the lines and creates a weird middle ground where um, oh. it's unclear if that's what's happening. Uh, is that, does that still count as a simulation? Or is it meaningfully different than this being the true reality? So in, in that sense, I think there's um, lots of interesting potential middle ground yeah. positions yeah. which uh, would be cool to explore. Yep, yep. The, the the anthropomorphizing or not of yes. of the of what is creating potentially the pro the, the simulation. Now, um, what do you think happens pre birth and post death? Um, hmm. Probably nothing. Or Occam's razor would the Occam's lead razor me answer? to believe sure. that probably nothing. <laughs> okay, the Occam's razor answer. Okay, and then what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Hmm. The most beautiful thing in the world, um, humanity. Tell us more, why? Um, hmm. oh, the most beautiful thing in the world for me is humanity. And I like humanity because, uh, well, I'm biased, partly. <laughs> but hmm. there is something aesthetically pleasing in a sense, or just the um, storyline of um, being confused apes stuck on a rock, floating through space, but still trying to do interesting things with your existence, I think is cool. And uh, it's kind of a rooting for the underdog vibe. <laughs> the world is big and complicated and uh, not very nice or gentle, but humanity is still trying to uh, stick it out and flourish. So, 
<laughs> Rooting for the underdog. I love it. We find ourselves as stewards of Earth. Good luck. See if you can handle it. Can you all play together? Basically. But yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's, it is very beautiful. It is, it is. Todor, this has been such an interesting episode. Thank mm. you. Thank you for coming on and teaching Thank us. Thank you for hosting me. We are very grateful. It's been such a pleasure. Um, holy cow, that was super fun. I mean, there's just so much to still understand about multi-agent environments, about competitive self-play, neural MMOs, like all the stuff that's, that you guys are doing. Um, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Check out the links below to openai.com, the Twitter for OpenAI, also Todor's links and his LinkedIn profile. Check all that out. And go and talk to more people, your friends, your coworkers, people online on social media about things like multi-agent environments, competitive self-play, neural MMOs. And go and, and, and share more of the questions around these concepts and go and talk to more people about them. Also, huge shout out to Ron Vogus for producing and directing. Thank you very much, Ron. We greatly appreciate it. And we did pretty well with all those videos. Good job, Ron. I'm proud of us. And support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support simulation. Our links are below. Help us grow and prosper. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.